英語聞き流しリスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com ドン・キーホーディ by Miguel de Cervantes Chapter 1 Which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of those gentlemen that keep a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing. An olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three quarters of his income. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and marketplace, who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the billhook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty, he was of a hearty habit, spare, gaunt featured, a very early riser and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quixada or Quesada. For here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject, although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain that he was called Quixana. This, however, is of but little importance to our tale, it will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentleman whenever he was at leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with such ardor and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuit of his field sports, and even the management of his property. And to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of tillage land to buy books of chivalry to read, and brought home as many of them as he could get. But of all there were none he liked so well as those of the famous Feliciano de Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly when in his reading he came upon courtships and cartels, where he often found passages like the reason of the unreason with which my reason is afflicted so weakens my reason that with reason I murmur at your beauty or again, the high heavens, that if your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars, render you deserving of the desert your greatness deserves. Over conceits of this sort the poor gentleman lost his wits, and used to lie awake striving to understand them and worm the meaning out of them, what Aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted had he come to life again for that special purpose. He was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Belianus gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars. He commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly as is there proposed, which no doubt he would have done, and made a successful piece of work of it too, had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man, and a graduate of Siguenta, as to which had been the better night, Palmarian of England or Amadis of Gaul. Master Nicholas, the village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him it was Don Galar, the brother of Amadis of Gaul, because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion, and was no Finnegan knight, nor lacrimose like his brother, while in the matter of valour he was not a whit behind him. In short, he became so absorbed in his books that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dark, poring over them, and what with little sleep and much reading his brains got so dry that he lost his wits. His fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books, enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, agonies, and all sorts of impossible nonsense, and it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true, that to him no history in the world had more reality in it. He used to say the Cid Roy Diaz was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants. He thought more of Bernardo del Carpio because at Ronthus Bias he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself of the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Antaeus the son of Terra in his arms. He approved highly of the giant Morganti, because, although of the giant breed which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But above all he admired Rinaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing everyone he met, and when beyond the seas he stole that image of Mahomet which, as his history says, was entirely of gold. To have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a gun alone he would have given his housekeeper, and his niece into the bargain. In short, his wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in this world hit upon, 
and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite, as well for the support of his own honour as for the service of his country, that he should make a knight errant of himself, roaming the world over in full armour and on horseback in quest of adventures, and putting in practice himself all that he had read of as being the usual practices of knights errant, righting every kind of wrong, and exposing himself to peril and danger from which, in the issue, he was to reap eternal renown and fame. Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm emperor of Trebizond at least, and so, led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution. The first thing he did was to clean up some armour that had belonged to his great-grandfather, and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scoured and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great defect in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a kind of half-helmet of pasteboard which, fitted on to the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that, in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to do. The ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger he set to work again, fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with its strength, and then, not caring to try any more experiments with it, he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which, with more quartos than a real and more blemishes than the steed of Gonla, that tantum pelis at Asafui, surpassed in his eyes the Bucephalus of Alexander or the Babieca of the Cid. Four days were spent in thinking what name to give him, because, as he said to himself, it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous, and one with such merits of his own, should be without some distinctive name, and he strove to adapt it so as to indicate what he had been before belonging to a knight errant, and what he then was, for it was only reasonable that, his master taking a new character, he should take a new name, and that it should be a distinguished and full-sounding one, befitting the new order and calling he was about to follow. And so, after having composed, struck out, rejected, added to, unmade, and remade a multitude of names out of his memory and fancy, he decided upon calling him Rocinante, a name, to his thinking, lofty, sonorous, and significant of his condition as a hack before he became what he now was, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. Having got a name for his horse so much to his taste, he was anxious to get one for himself, and he was eight days more pondering over this point, till at last he made up his mind to call himself Don Quixote, whence, as has been already said, the authors of this voracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt Quixada, and not Quesada as others would have it. Recollecting, however, that the valiant Amadis was not content to call himself curtly Amadis and nothing more, but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous, and called himself Amadis of Gaul, he, like a good knight, resolved to add on the name of his, and to style himself Don Quixote of La Mancha, whereby, he considered, he described accurately his origin and country, and did honour to it in taking his surname from it. So then, his armour being furbished, his morion turned into a helmet, his hat christened, and he himself confirmed, he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look out for a lady to be in love with, for a knight errant without love was like a tree without leaves or fruit, or a body without a soul. As he said to himself, if, for my sins, or by my good fortune, I come across some giant hereabouts, a common occurrence with knights errant, and overthrow him in one onslaught, or cleave him asunder to the waist, or, in short, vanquish and subdue him, will it not be well to have someone I may send him to as a present, that he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady, and in a humble, submissive voice say, I am the giant Caraculiambro, lord of the island of Malandrania, vanquished in single combat by the never sufficiently extolled knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has commanded me to present myself before your grace, that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure. Oh, our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of this speech, especially when he had thought of some one to call his lady. There was, so the story goes, in a village near his own a very good-looking farm girl with whom he had been at one time in love, though, so far as is known, she never knew it nor gave a thought to the matter. Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and upon her he thought fit to confer the title of lady of his thoughts, and after some search for a name which should not be out of harmony with her own, and should suggest and indicate that of a princess and great lady, he decided upon calling her Dulcinea del Toboso, she being of El Toboso, a name, to his mind, musical, uncommon, and significant, like all those he had already bestowed upon himself and the things belonging to him. Chapter 2. Which treats of the first sally the ingenious Don Quixote made from home. These preliminaries settled, he did not care to put off any longer the execution of his design, urged on to it by the thought of all the world was losing by his delay, 
seeing what wrongs he intended to right, grievances to redress, injustices to repair, abuses to remove, and duties to discharge. So, without giving notice of his intention to anyone, and without anybody seeing him, one morning before the dawning of the day, which was one of the hottest of the month of July, he donned his suit of armor, mounted Rocinante with his patched up helmet on, braced his buckler, took his lance, and by the back door of the yard sallied forth upon the plain in the highest contentment and satisfaction at seeing with what ease he had made a beginning with his grand purpose. But scarcely did he find himself upon the open plain, when a terrible thought struck him, one all but enough to make him abandon the enterprise at the very outset. It occurred to him that he had not been dubbed a knight, and that according to the law of chivalry he neither could nor ought to bear arms against any knight, and that even if he had been, still he ought, as a novice knight, to wear white armor, without a device upon the shield until by his prowess he had earned one. These reflections made him waver in his purpose, but his craze being stronger than any reasoning, he made up his mind to have himself dubbed a knight by the first one he came across, following the example of others in the same case, as he had read in the books that brought him to this pass. As for white armor, he resolved, on the first opportunity, to scour his until it was whiter than an ermine, and so comforting himself he pursued his way, taking that which his horse chose, for in this he believed lay the essence of adventures. Thus setting out, our new-fledged adventurer paced along, talking to himself and saying, who knows but that in time to come, when the voracious history of my famous deeds is made known, the sage who writes it, when he has to set forth my first sally in the early morning, will do it after this fashion. Scarce had the rubicund Apollo spread or the face of the broad spacious earth the golden threads of his bright hair, Scarce had the little birds of painted plumage attuned their notes to hell with dulcet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn, that, deserting the soft couch of her jealous spouse, was appearing to mortals at the gates and balconies of the Manchegan horizon, when the renowned knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, quitting the lazy down, mounted his celebrated steed Rocinante and began to traverse the ancient and famous Campo de Montiel, which in fact he was actually traversing. Happy the age, happy the time, he continued, in which shall be made known my deeds of fame, worthy to be moulded in brass, carved in marble, limned in pictures, for a memorial for ever. And thou, O sage magician, whoever thou art, to whom it shall fall to be the chronicler of this wondrous history, forget not, I entreat thee, my good Rocinante, the constant companion of my ways and wanderings. Presently he broke out again, as if he were love-stricken in earnest, O Princess Dulcinea, lady of this captive heart, a grievous wrong hast thou done me to drive me forth with scorn, and with inexorable obduracy banish me from the presence of thy beauty. O lady, deign to hold in remembrance this heart, thy vassal, that thus in anguish pines for love of thee. So he went on stringing together these and other absurdities, all in the style of those his books had taught him, imitating their language as well as he could, and all the while he rode so slowly and the sun mounted so rapidly and with such fervour that it was enough to melt his brains if he had any. Nearly all day he travelled without anything remarkable happening to him, at which he was in despair, for he was anxious to encounter someone at once upon whom to try the might of his strong arm. Writers there are who say the first adventure he met with was that of Puerto Lapis, others say it was that of the windmills, but what I have ascertained on this point, and what I have found written in the annals of La Mancha, is that he was on the road all day, and towards nightfall his hack and he found themselves dead tired and hungry, when, looking all around to see if he could discover any castle or shepherd shanty where he might refresh himself and relieve his sore wants, he perceived not far out of his road an inn, which was as welcome as a star guiding him to the portals, if not the palaces, of his redemption, and quickening his pace he reached it just as night was setting in. At the door were standing two young women, girls of the district as they call them, on their way to Seville with some carriers who had chanced to halt that night at the inn, and as, happened what might to our adventurer, everything he saw or image seemed to him to be and to happen after the fashion of what he read of, the moment he saw the inn he pictured it to himself as a castle with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver, not forgetting the drawbridge and moat and all the belongings usually ascribed to castles of the sort. To this inn, which to him seemed a castle, he advanced, and at a short distance from it he checked Rocinante, hoping that some dwarf would show himself upon the battlements, and by sound of trumpet give notice that a knight was approaching the castle. But seeing that they were slow about it, and that Rocinante was in a hurry to reach the stable, he made for the inn door, and perceived the two gay damsels who were standing there, and who seemed to him to be two fair maidens or lovely ladies taking their ease at the castle gate. At this moment it so happened that a swineherd who was going through the stubbles collecting a drove of pigs, for, without any apology, that is what they are called, gave a blast of his horn to bring them together, and forthwith it seemed to Don Quixote to be what he was expecting, the signal of some dwarf announcing his arrival, and so with prodigious satisfaction he rode up to the inn and to the ladies, 
who, seeing a man of this sort approaching in full armor and with lance and buckler, were turning in dismay into the inn, when Don Quixote, guessing their fear by their flight, raising his pasteboard visor, disclosed his dry dusty visage, and with courteous bearing and gentle voice addressed them, Your ladyships need not fly or fear any rudeness, for that it belongs not to the order of knighthood which I profess to offer to anyone, much less to high-born maidens as your appearance proclaims you to be. The girls were looking at him and straining their eyes to make out the features which the clumsy visor obscured, but when they heard themselves called maidens, a thing so much out of their line, they could not restrain their laughter, which made Don Quixote wax indignant, and say, Modesty becomes the fair, and moreover laughter that has little cause is great silliness. This, however, I say not to pain or anger you, for my desire is none other than to serve you. The incomprehensible language and the unpromising looks of our cavalier only increased the lady's laughter, and that increased his irritation, and matters might have gone farther if at that moment the landlord had not come out, who, being a very fat man, was a very peaceful one. He, seeing this grotesque figure clad in armor that did not match any more than his saddle, bridle, lance, buckler, or corslet, was not at all indisposed to join the damsels in their manifestations of amusement, but, in truth, standing in awe of such a complicated armament, he thought it best to speak him fairly, so he said, Senor Caballero, if your worship wants lodging, baiting the bed, for there is not one in the inn, there is plenty of everything else here. Don Quixote, observing the respectful bearing of the alcaide of the fortress, for so innkeeper and in seemed in his eyes, made answer, Sir Castellan, for me anything will suffice, for my armor is my only wear, my only rest the fray. The host fancied he called him Castellan because he took him for a worthy of Castile, though he was in fact an Andalusian, and one from the strand of San Lucar, as crafty a thief as Caucus and as full of tricks as a student or a page. In that case, said he, your bed is on the flinty rock, your sleep to watch alway. And if so, you may dismount and safely reckon upon any quantity of sleeplessness under this roof for a twelvemonth, not to say for a single night. So saying, he advanced to hold a stirrup for Don Quixote, who got down with great difficulty and exertion, for he had not broken his fast all day, and then charged the host to take great care of his horse, as he was the best bit of flesh that ever ate bread in this world. The landlord eyed him over but did not find him as good as Don Quixote said, nor even half as good, and putting him up in the stable, he returned to see what might be wanted by his guest, whom the damsels, who had by this time made their peace with him, were now relieving of his armor. They had taken off his breastplate and backpiece, but they neither knew nor saw how to open his gorget or remove his makeshift helmet, for he had fastened it with green ribbons, which, as there was no untying the knots, required to be cut. This, however, he would not by any means consent to, so he remained all the evening with his helmet on, the drollest and oddest figure that can be imagined, and while they were removing his armor, taking the baggages who were about it for ladies of high degree belonging to the castle, he said to them with great sprightliness. Oh, never, surely, was there knight so served by hand of dame, as served was he, on Quixote height, when from his town he came, with maidens waiting on himself, princesses on his hack. Or Rocinante, for that, ladies mine, is my horse's name, and Don Quixote of La Mancha is my own, for though I had no intention of declaring myself until my achievements in your service and honour had made me known, the necessity of adapting that old ballad of Lancelot to the present occasion has given you the knowledge of my name altogether prematurely. A time, however, will come for your ladyships to command and me to obey, and then the might of my arm will show my desire to serve you. The girls, who were not used to hearing rhetoric of this sort, had nothing to say in reply, they only asked him if he wanted anything to eat. I will gladly eat a bit of something, said Don Quixote, for I feel it would come very seasonably. The day happened to be a Friday, and in the hole in there was nothing but some pieces of the fish they call in Castile Abadejo, in Andalusia Bacchiao, and in some places Curadillo, and in others Troutlet, so they asked him if he thought he could eat Troutlet, for there was no other fish to give him. If there be Troutlets enough, said Don Quixote, they will be the same thing as a trout for it is all one to me whether I am given eight reals in small change or a piece of eight, moreover, it may be that these troutlets are like veal, which is better than beef, or kid, which is better than goat. But whatever it be let it come quickly, for the burden and pressure of arms cannot be borne without support to the inside. They laid a table for him at the door of the inn for the sake of the air, and the host brought him a portion of ill-soaked and worse cooked stockfish, and a piece of bread as black and mouldy as his own armour, but a laughable sight it was to see him eating, for having his helmet on, and the beaver up, he could not with his own hands put anything into his mouth unless some one else placed it there, and this service one of the ladies rendered him. But to give him anything to drink was impossible, or would have been so had not the landlord bored a reed, and putting one end in his mouth poured the wine into him through the other, 
all which he bore with patience rather than sever the ribbons of his helmet. While this was going on there came up to the inner Sogelder, who, as he approached, sounded his reed pipe four or five times, and thereby completely convinced Don Quixote that he was in some famous castle, and that they were regaling him with music, and that the stockfish was trout, the bread the whitest, the wenches ladies, and the landlord the castellan of the castle, and consequently he held that his enterprise and sally had been to some purpose. But still it distressed him to think he had not been dubbed a knight, for it was plain to him he could not lawfully engage in any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood. Chapter 3. Wherein is related the droll way in which Don Quixote had himself dubbed a knight. Harassed by this reflection, he made haste with his scanty pothouse supper, and having finished it called the landlord, and shutting himself into the stable with him, fell on his knees before him, saying, From this spot I rise not, valiant knight, until your courtesy grants me the boon I seek, one that will redound to your praise and the benefit of the human race. The landlord, seeing his guest at his feet and hearing a speech of this kind, stood staring at him in bewilderment not knowing what to do or say, and entreating him to rise, but all to no purpose until he had agreed to grant the boon demanded of him. I look for no less, my lord, from your high magnificence, replied Don Quixote, and I have to tell you that the boon I have asked and your liberality has granted is that you shall dub me knight tomorrow morning, and that tonight I shall watch my arms in the chapel of this your castle, thus tomorrow, as I have said, will be accomplished what I so much desire enabling me lawfully to roam through all the four quarters of the world seeking adventures on behalf of those in distress, as is the duty of chivalry and of knights errant like myself, whose ambition is directed to such deeds. The landlord, who, as has been mentioned, was something of a wag, and had already some suspicion of his guest's one of wits, was quite convinced of it on hearing talk of this kind from him, and to make sport for the night he determined to fall in with his humour. So he told him he was quite right in pursuing the object he had in view, and that such a motive was natural and becoming in cavaliers as distinguished as he seemed and his gallant bearing showed him to be, and that he himself in his younger days had followed the same honourable calling, roaming in quest of adventures in various parts of the world, among others the curing grounds of Malaga, the Isles of Ryron, the precinct of Seville, the little market of Segovia, the Oliveira of Valencia, the Rondilla of Granada, the Strand of San Lucar, the Colt of Cordova, the taverns of Toledo and divers other quarters, where he had proved the nimbleness of his feet and the lightness of his fingers, doing many wrongs, cheating many widows, ruining maids and swindling minors, and, in short, bringing himself under the notice of almost every tribunal and court of justice in Spain, until at last he had retired to this castle of his, where he was living upon his property and upon that of others, and where he received all knights errant of whatever rank or condition they might be, all for the great love he bore them and that they might share their substance with him in return for his benevolence. He told him, moreover, that in this castle of his there was no chapel in which he could watch his armour, as it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt, but that in a case of necessity it might, he knew, be watched anywhere, and he might watch it that night in a courtyard of the castle, and in the morning, God willing, the requisite ceremonies might be performed so as to have him dubbed a knight, and so thoroughly dubbed that nobody could be more so. He asked if he had any money with him, to which Don Quixote replied that he had not a farthing, as in the histories of knights errant he had never read of any of them carrying any. On this point the landlord told him he was mistaken, for, though not recorded in the histories, because in the author's opinion there was no need to mention anything so obvious and necessary as money and clean shirts, it was not to be supposed therefore that they did not carry them, and he might regard it as certain and established that all knights errant, about whom there were so many full and unimpeachable books, carried well-furnished purses in case of emergency, and likewise carried shirts and a little box of ointment to cure the wounds they received. For in those plains and deserts where they engaged in combat and came out wounded, it was not always that there was some one to cure them, unless indeed they had for a friend some sage magician to succour them at once by fetching through the air upon a cloud some damsel or dwarf with a vial of water of such virtue that by tasting one drop of it they were cured of their hurts and wounds in an instant and left a sound as if they had not received any damage whatever. But in case this should not occur, the knights of old took care to see that their squires were provided with money and other requisites such as lint and ointments for healing purposes, and when it happened that knights had no squires, which was rarely and seldom the case, they themselves carried everything in cunning saddlebags that were hardly seen on the horse's croup, as if it were something else of more importance, because, unless for some such reason, carrying saddlebags was not very favourably regarded among knights errant. He therefore advised him, and, as his godson so soon to be, he might even command him, never from that time forth to travel without money and the usual requirements, and he would find the advantage of them when he least expected it. Don Quixote promised to follow his advice scrupulously, and it was arranged forthwith that he should watch his armour in a large yard at one side of the inn, so, collecting it all together, 
Don Quixote placed it on a trough that stood by the side of a well, and bracing his buckler on his arm he grasped his lance and began with a stately air to march up and down in front of the trough, and as he began his march night began to fall. The landlord told all the people who were in the inn about the craze of his guest, the watching of the armor, and the dubbing ceremony he contemplated. Full of wonder at so strange a form of madness, they flocked to see it from a distance, and observed with what composure he sometimes paced up and down, or sometimes, leaning on his lance, gazed on his armor without taking his eyes off it for ever so long, and as the night closed in with a light from the moon so brilliant that it might vie with his that lent it, everything the novice knight did was plainly seen by all. Meanwhile one of the carriers who were in the inn thought fit to water his team, and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor as it lay on the trough, but he seeing the other approach hailed him in a loud voice, O thou, whoever thou art, rash knight that comest to lay hands on the armor of the most valorous errant that ever gird on sword, have a care what thou dost, touch it not unless thou wouldst lay down thy life as the penalty of thy rashness. The carrier gave no heed to these words, and he would have done better to heed them if he had been heedful of his health, but seizing it by the straps flung the armor some distance from him. Seeing this, Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, and fixing his thoughts, apparently, upon his lady Dulcinea, exclaimed, Aid me, lady mine, in this the first encounter that presents itself to this breast which thou holdest in subjection, let not thy favour and protection fail me in this first jeopardy, and, with these words and others to the same purpose, dropping his buckler he lifted his lance with both hands and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that he stretched him on the ground, so stunned that had he followed it up with a second there would have been no need of a surgeon to cure him. This done, he picked up his armour and returned to his beat with the same serenity as before. Shortly after this, another, not knowing what had happened, for the carrier still lay senseless, came with the same object of giving water to his mules, and was proceeding to remove the armour in order to clear the trough, when Don Quixote, without uttering a word or imploring aid from anyone, once more dropped his buckler and once more lifted his lance, and without actually breaking the second carrier's head into pieces, made more than three of it, for he laid it open in four. At the noise all the people of the inn ran to the spot, and among them the landlord. Seeing this, Don Quixote braced his buckler on his arm, and with his hand on his sword exclaimed, O lady of beauty, strength and support of my faint heart, it is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on this thy captive knight on the brink of so mighty an adventure. By this he felt himself so inspired that he would not have flinched if all the carriers in the world had assailed him. The comrades of the wounded perceiving the plight they were in began from a distance to shower stones on Don Quixote, who screened himself as best he could with his buckler, not daring to quit the trough and leave his armour unprotected. The landlord shouted to them to leave him alone, for he had already told them that he was mad, and as a madman he would not be accountable even if he killed them all. Still louder shouted Don Quixote, calling them knaves and traitors, and the lord of the castle, who will not knights errant to be treated in this fashion, a villain and a low-born knight whom had he received the order of knighthood, he would call to account for his treachery. But of you, he cried, base and vile rabble, I make no account, fling, strike, come on, do all ye can against me, ye shall see what the reward of your folly and insolence will be. This he uttered with so much spirit and boldness that he filled his assailants with a terrible fear, and as much for this reason as at the persuasion of the landlord they left off stoning him, and he allowed them to carry off the wounded, and with the same calmness and composure as before resumed the watch over his armour. But these freaks of his guest were not much to the liking of the landlord, so he determined to cut matters short and confer upon him at once the unlucky order of knighthood before any further misadventure could occur, so, going up to him, he apologised for the rudeness which, without his knowledge, had been offered to him by these low people, who, however, had been well punished for their audacity. As he had already told him, he said, there was no chapel in the castle, nor was it needed for what remained to be done, for, as he understood the ceremonial of the order, the whole point of being dubbed a knight lay in the accolade and in the slap on the shoulder, and that could be administered in the middle of a field, and that he had now done all that was needful as to watching the armour, for all requirements were satisfied by a watch of two hours only, while he had been more than four about it. Don Quixote believed it all, and told him he stood there ready to obey him, and to make an end of it with as much dispatch as possible, for, if he were again attacked, and felt himself to be dubbed knight, he would not, he thought, leave a soul alive in the castle, except such as out of respect he might spare at his bidding. Thus warned and menaced, the castle and forthwith brought out a book in which he used to enter the straw and barley he served out to the carriers, and, with a lad carrying a candle end, and the two damsels already mentioned, he returned to where Don Quixote stood, and bade him kneel down. Then, reading from his account book as if he were repeating some devout prayer, in the middle of his delivery he raised his hand and gave him a sturdy blow on the neck, and then, 
with his own sword, a smart slap on the shoulder, all the while muttering between his teeth as if he was saying his prayers. Having done this, he directed one of the ladies to gird on his sword, which she did with great self-possession and gravity, and not a little was required to prevent a burst of laughter at each stage of the ceremony, but what they had already seen of the novice knight's prowess kept their laughter within bounds. On girding him with the sword the worthy lady said to him, May God make your worship a very fortunate knight, and grant you success in battle. Don Quixote asked her name in order that he might from that time forward know to whom he was beholden for the favour he had received, as he meant to confer upon her some portion of the honour he acquired by the might of his arm. She answered with great humility that she was called La Talusa, and that she was the daughter of a cobbler of Toledo who lived in the stalls of San Cobinia, and that wherever she might be she would serve and esteem him as her lord. Don Quixote said in reply that she would do him a favour if thenceforward she assumed the don and called herself Doña Talusa. She promised she would, and then the other buckled on his spur, and with her followed almost the same conversation as with the Lady of the Sword. He asked her name, and she said it was La Molinera, and that she was the daughter of a respectable miller of Andacara, and of her likewise Don Quixote requested that she would adopt the Don and call herself Doña Molinera, making offers to her further services and favours. Having thus, with hot haste and speed, brought to a conclusion these never till now seen ceremonies, Don Quixote was on thorns until he saw himself on horseback sallying forth in quest of adventures, and saddling Rocinante at once he mounted, and embracing his host, as he returned thanks for his kindness in knighting him, he addressed him in language so extraordinary that it is impossible to convey an idea of it or report it. The landlord, to get him out of the inn, replied with no less rhetoric though with shorter words, and without calling upon him to pay the reckoning let him go with a godspeed. Chapter 4 Of what happened to our knight when he left the INN Day was dawning when Don Quixote quitted the inn, so happy, so gay, so exhilarated at finding himself now dubbed a knight, that his joy was like to burst his horse girths. However, recalling the advice of his host as to the requisites he ought to carry with him, especially that referring to money and shirts, he determined to go home and provide himself with all, and also with a squire, for he reckoned upon securing a farm labourer, a neighbour of his, a poor man with a family, but very well qualified for the office of squire to a knight. With this object he turned his horse's head towards his village, and Rocinante, thus reminded of his old quarters, stepped out so briskly that he hardly seemed to tread the earth. He had not gone far, when out of a thicket on his right there seemed to come feeble cries as of someone in distress, and the instant he heard them he exclaimed, Thanks be to heaven for the favour it accords me, that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation I have undertaken, and gathering the fruit of my ambition. These cries, no doubt, come from some man or woman in want of help and needing my aid and protection, and wheeling, he turned Rocinante in the direction whence the cries seemed to proceed. He had gone but a few paces into the wood, when he saw a mare tied to an oak, and tied to another, and stripped from the waist upwards, a youth of about fifteen years of age, from whom the cries came. Nor were they without cause, for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands, repeating, your mouth shut and your eyes open. While the youth made answer, I won't do it again, master mine, by God's passion I won't do it again, and I'll take more care of the flock another time. Seeing what was going on, Don Quixote said in an angry voice, Discourteous knight, it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself, mount your steed and take your lance, for there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied, and I will make you know that you are behaving as a coward. The farmer, seeing before him this figure in full armour brandishing a lance over his head, gave himself up for dead, and made answer meekly, Sir Knight, this youth that I am chastising is my servant, employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that I have hard by, and he is so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish him for his carelessness and knavery he says I do it out of niggardliness, to escape paying him the wages I owe him, and before God, and on my soul, he lies. Lies before me, base clown, said Don Quixote. By the sun that shines on us I have a mind to run you through with this lance. Pay him at once without another word, if not, by the God that rules us I will make an end of you, and annihilate you on the spot, release him instantly. The farmer hung his head, and without a word untied his servant, of whom Don Quixote asked how much his master owed him. He replied, nine months at seven reals a month. Don Quixote added it up, found that it came to sixty-three reals, and told the farmer to pay it down immediately, if he did not want to die for it. The trembling clown replied that as he lived and by the oath he had sworn, though he had not sworn any, it was not so much for there were to be taken into account and deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him, and a reel for two blood lettings when he was sick. All that is very well, said Don Quixote, 
But let the shoes and the bloodletting stand as a stuff against the blows you have given him without any cause, for if he spoiled the leather of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged that of his body, and if the barber took blood from him when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was sound, so on that score he owes you nothing. The difficulty is, Sir Knight, that I have no money here, let Andres come home with me, and I will pay him all, real by real. I go with him, said the youth. Nay, God forbid. No, Signor, not for the world, for once alone with me, he would ray me like a Saint Bartholomew. He will do nothing of the kind, said Don Quixote, I have only to command, and he will obey me, and as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood which he has received, I leave him free, and I guarantee the payment. Consider what you are saying, Senor, said the youth, this master of mine is not a knight, nor has he received any order of knighthood, for he is Juan Haldudo the Rich, of Quintaner. That matters little, replied Don Quixote, there may be Haldudo's knights, moreover, every one is the son of his works. That is true, said Andres, but this master of mine, of what works is he the son, when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? I do not refuse, brother Andres, said the farmer, be good enough to come along with me, and I swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world to pay you as I have agreed, real by real, and perfumed. For the perfumery I excuse you, said Don Quixote, give it to him in reals, and I shall be satisfied, and see that you do as you have sworn, if not, by the same oath I swear to come back and hunt you out and punish you, and I shall find you though you should lie closer than a lizard. And if you desire to know who it is lays this command upon you, that you be more firmly bound to obey it, know that I am the valorous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of wrongs and injustices, and so, God be with you, and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that have been already declared to you. So saying, he gave Rocinante the spur and was soon out of reach. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight, he turned to his boy Andres, and said, Come here, my son, I want to pay you what I owe you, as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me. My oath on it, said Andres, your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight, may he live a thousand years, for, as he is a valiant and just judge, by Roque, if you do not pay me, he will come back and do as he said. My oath on it, too, said the farmer, but as I have a strong affection for you, I want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment, and seizing him by the arm, he tied him up again, and gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead. Now, Master Andres, said the farmer, call on the undoer of wrongs, you will find he won't undo that, though I am not sure that I have quite done with you, for I have a good mind to flay you alive. But at last he untied him, and gave him leave to go look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution. Andres went off rather down in the mouth, swearing he would go to look for the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha and tell him exactly what had happened, and that all would have to be repaid him sevenfold, but for all that, he went off weeping, while his master stood laughing. Thus did the valiant Don Quixote right that wrong, and, thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place, as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with his knighthood, he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content, saying in a low voice, Well mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth, O Dulcinea del Toboso, fairest of the fair. Since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy full will and pleasure a knight so renowned as is and will be Don Quixote of La Mancha, who, as all the world knows, yesterday received the order of knighthood, and hath today righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated, who hath today plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor so wantonly lashing the tender child. He now came to a road branching in four directions, and immediately he was reminded of those crossroads where knights errant used to stop to consider which road they should take. In imitation of them he halted for a while, and after having deeply considered it, he gave Rocinante his head, submitting his own will to that of his hack, who followed out his first intention, which was to make straight for his own stable. After he had gone about two miles Don Quixote perceived a large party of people, who, as afterwards appeared, were some Toledo traders, on their way to buy silk at Mercia. There were six of them coming along under their sunshades, with four servants mounted, and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote described them when the fancy possessed him that this must be some new adventure, and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read of in his books, here seemed to come one made on purpose, which he resolved to attempt. So with a lofty bearing and determination he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups, got his lance ready, brought his buckler before his breast, and planting himself in the middle of the road, stood waiting the approach of these knights errant for such he now considered and held them to be, and when they had come near enough to see and hear, he exclaimed with a haughty gesture, All the world stand, 
unless all the world confess that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso. The traders halted at the sound of this language and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it, and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner, they wished, however, to learn quietly what was the object of this confession that was demanded of them, and one of them, who was rather fond of a joke and was very sharp-witted, said to him, Sir Knight, we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of, show her to us, for, if she be of such beauty as you suggest, with all our hearts and without any pressure we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us. If I were to show her to you, replied Don Quixote, what merit would you have in confessing a truth so manifest? The essential point is that without seeing her you must believe, confess, affirm, swear and defend it, else ye have to do with me in battle, ill-conditioned, arrogant rabble that ye are, and come ye on, one by one as the order of knighthood requires, or altogether as is the custom and via usage of your breed, here do I bide and await you relying on the justice of the cause I maintain. Sir Knight, replied the traitor, I entreat your worship in the name of this present company of princes, that, to save us from charging our consciences with the confession of a thing we have never seen or heard of, and one moreover so much to the prejudice of the empresses and queens of the Alcaria, and Estremadura, your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of this lady, though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat, for by the thread one gets at the ball, and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy, and you will be content and pleased. Nay, I believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind of one eye, and distilling vermilion and sulphur from the other, we would nevertheless, to gratify your worship, say all in her favour that you desire. She distills nothing of the kind, vile rabble, said Don Quixote, burning with rage, nothing of the kind, I say, only ambergris and civet in cotton, nor is she one-eyed or humpbacked, but straighter than a Guadarrama spindle, but ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady. And so saying, he charged with levelled lance against the one who had spoken, with such fury and fierceness that, if luck had not contrived that Rocinante should stumble midway and come down, it would have gone hard with the rash traitor. Down went Rocinante, and over went his master, rolling along the ground for some distance, and when he tried to rise he was unable, so encumbered was he with lance, buckler, spurs, helmet, and the weight of his old armour, and all the while he was struggling to get up he kept saying, Fly not, cowards and caitiffs! Stay, for not by my fault, but my horses, am I stretched here? One of the muleteers in attendance, who could not have had much good nature in him, hearing the poor prostrate man blustering in this style, was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs, and coming up to him he seized his lance, and having broken it in pieces, with one of them he began so to belabor our Don Quixote that, notwithstanding and in spite of his armour, he milled him like a measure of wheat. His masters called out not to lay on so hard and to leave him alone, but the muleteer's blood was up, and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath, and gathering up the remaining fragments of the lance he finished with a discharge upon the unhappy victim, who all through the storm of sticks that rained on him never ceased threatening heaven, and earth, and the brigands, for such they seemed to him. At last the muleteer was tired, and the traders continued their journey, taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had been cudgelled. He when he found himself alone made another effort to rise, but if he was unable when whole and sound, how was he to rise after having been thrashed and well nigh knocked to pieces? And yet he esteemed himself fortunate, as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight Terence mishap, and entirely, he considered, the fault of his horse. However, battered in body as he was, to rise was beyond his power. Hatch, Hatch, T, H, P, P, dot com.